Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on South Africa's water utility challenges, hosted on behalf of Xylem, a leader in developing innovative water solutions through smart technology. My name is Shannon Derehove, and I'll be assisting the speakers in today's session. Before we get started, please note the chat and the Q&A are available to you. Please post your questions in the Q&A and your comments in the chat. Both the Q&A and the chat are at the bottom of your screen. Please also be aware that we are recording this webinar and we'll send the recording to you when it's available. We're also streaming live on YouTube and we'll share the link with you in the chat when it's available. Today's panel will unpack whether advances in water technologies can help reverse South Africa's water infrastructure failures and challenges. South African utilities are losing almost half their water revenues through aging infrastructure, pipeline leaks and stressed management systems. Water utility managers and stakeholders are stuck in the middle, being put under pressure to resolve these issues by making the right investment choices. The speakers discussing this topic with facilitator James Francis include Silva Piri from CPRO Africa, Xylem Engineering Manager Vanessa Govender, and Xylem Southern Africa Sales and Operations Manager Ruben Marawa. Unfortunately, owing to unforeseen circumstances, environmental advisor, speaker, and author Dr. Anthony Turton is no longer able to join the session. But without further ado, I'll hand over now to facilitator James Francis to start the discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Shannon. And I'd like to say thank you to everybody for joining us today for this discussion, unpacking the potential of technology in addressing uh, challenges at water utilities in South Africa, but also in other countries. While South Africa, we can paint a grim picture about problems with utilities here. There are also challenges facing utilities across the world. And even utilities are doing fairly well. There is also the perennial challenge of modernization what technologies are out there? What can I risk bringing in there? What does it take? What should I be focusing on? We're going to be looking at this today. So thank you very much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. I'm going to reintroduce my guests, my panelists in a second here. But first, uh, my name is James Francis. I'll be the facilitator for today's uh, uh, conversation. We have a Q&A in there as well. Please do pop your questions in there. I understand you can also vote for a question if you feel it's very relevant. When we get to the end of our formal discussion, we are going to jump in those questions, into those questions, giving a chance for you guys to really get direct information what you need. The panelists we have here today are salted professionals. They have been working in the, the water utility industries for a while, for a long time not only because they're currently representing major brands and major technology providers in the space, but they have worked firsthand on projects in the water utility space. They have worked with the people who work on these things. And this, to me, is a critical part of today's conversation. We can talk a lot about the 10,000-foot view uh, problems, you know, the issues that we're seeing out there. But what about the people on the front line? What about people who have to make this happen? This webinar is for you. This is your opportunity to really get more tangible answers and understanding about what the potential is out there for you to address your critical issues. And the way you're going to put those in the front is please to use the Q&A. Tell us about your critical issues. Uh, you can be specific. You can be non-specific if you'd like to uh, protect yourself. But please let us know and let's get our experts to look at that. With that, let's jump into our topic today. We are talking about water supply and sanitation services. These are incredibly crucial. Firstly, they're crucial for securing water in the future. Uh, just this morning, I saw a headline of expert warning that Gauteng, especially Johannesburg and Tuane, could face a day zero situation within five years due to drought. Hopefully we can avoid that, but there is a lot of work to be done. Water utilities are also crucial for developing service delivery. According to the World Bank, there are still millions of people who lack access to safe drinking water. They also mentioned that 20%, one out of every five infant deaths, are due to waterborne disease. We know water is critically important. It is the sixth uh, sustainable development goal as well. And in my opinion, the one goal that practically underpins all of them. Water is absolutely crucial. Water delivery is very crucial. It's a part of development. It's a part of modernization. That means that you guys who are working in this industry, especially in the front line, have a lot on your shoulders. 
how can technology alleviate that? What are the challenges you are facing? And how can we use modern technologies and the right solutions in the right place to change that? So our panelists today, as uh, Shannon said, unfortunately, Dr. Anthony Turton will not be joining us today due to unforeseen circumstances. Um, but we still have great experts here. So we have Silver Piri, who is the head of projects at CEPRO Africa, Vanessa Govender, who is the engineering manager for Xylem Africa, and then Ruben Morowa, who is sales and operations manager at Xylem Southern Africa. So gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. Let's jump into the first portion of this. And Vanessa, and I think I'd like to start with you. We talk a lot about water technology out there today. There's been a great revolution in efficiencies, data, etc. But um, can you give us some examples of what's out there? What, what's in your career stood out to you in terms of water technologies today? Hi, James, and a, and a very good afternoon to, to our audience. And thank you so much for this opportunity to address you on a very critical aspect and a very important resource for this world. I, you know, personally, I, I'd like to start uh, because I'm a really a big fan of the drop reports. Uh, you know, the blue drop has shown a decline in our water quality from 2014 to 2024. Uh, our green drop report has shown almost 334 wastewater systems in critical condition. And similarly, as you mentioned earlier, uh, our blue, uh, no drop report is showing that we've moved from about 37% to almost 50% of non-revenue water. All these statistics, as, as gloomy as they may seem, but they also point in a particular direction, which is the rapid decay of infrastructure in our potable water systems, our wastewater systems, and our distribution networks. But I'd like to point out that this problem that is faced by our country and our utilities, these are not unique. We've seen this across the continent, across the world, that our utilities are facing a this growing demand, but having to maintain a very aging infrastructure. So in response, what are we seeing in terms of technology trends? is we are seeing the water undergoing a digital transformation. Uh, what we are seeing is the enhancement of digital systems coming in to manage the infrastructure, manage the efficiency and sustainability of this infrastructure. So we do see evolution where operations are becoming more automated and uh, connected, but we are also seeing digital revolution Especially in recent years, we see the emergence of solutions that are flexible enough to consolidate data from diverse sources uh, using diverse data into powerful algorithms, employing artificial intelligence into these algorithms. And what does this do? It empowers the utility with decision intelligence. Uh, this enhances their operational efficiency, their sustainability, and importantly, we see that it moves the utility from a state of reaction to a state of proaction. So some of these trends, uh, you know, very quickly, uh, they include the, the wider use of connected equipment uh, that use edge computing, uh, IoT technology, uh, by way of example, uh, intelligent pumps that are fitted with uh, control algorithms to ensure it's always operating at that optimum efficiency and maintaining that process stability. Uh, these digitally enhanced equipment are further fitted with IoT capabilities. So that gives us access to scores and scores of field data. Then we also see the implementation of machine learning systems on really critical pieces of equipment that, that pushes us into that position of predictive maintenance where we can maximize uptime and minimize unforeseen downtime. Another growing trend that I've uh, witnessed and, and most of my colleagues, we can see this moving worldwide, is the implementation of digital twins. And that provides that holistic view of the system and also provides for that advanced simulations and scenario planning. We also see the strong adoption of advanced metering infrastructure coming in where we can accurately measure consumption but also bring the value add of efficient billing. So, you know, to cap it all off as well, we see the value add of technologies coming in of leak detection, in-pipe leak detection technologies as well into the space. Back to you, James. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Vanessa. I, I mean, it's very exciting looking at the opportunities out there, especially, uh, firstly, data, being able to use both historic and current data for better planning. Uh, there's something to be said around policies working in there, uh, IoT obviously being a very big part of this. And now we're seeing the emergence of digital twins, which ones were reserved for aircraft engines. So there's so a lot of potential out there, but I think let's then look at what the realities are for the guys out there. Silver, you work a lot with teams on the ground. You see what these guys encounter there. We've spoken about the potential of technology, but before we can unpack that a bit further, we need to kind of look at what is the situation? What are the problems we're trying to address out there? Uh, what are you seeing on the ground? What are the barriers that these guys are hitting in terms of... Uh, I suppose what they're facing in terms of problems, but also the hierarchy supporting them, as well as suppliers. I know this is a event brought to us by a vendor in the space, but uh, maybe let's put them on the spot. What do you see that's frustrating people who are working at the front lines? Yeah, thank, thank you, James. So I hope I'm not the passenger that has to land the plane today. <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon and welcome to all the, the, all those that are joining us. Yeah, I think for, for me, uh, you know, I'm someone who's been very passionate about water and water issues. Um, and I have been on the ground for, for, for many years, you know, in this water, uh, you know, utilities uh, industry. Uh, what I've seen on the ground, you know, when you come to, to reality is um, you, you've got your utility uh, managers. Who are the people that have to deal with the day-to-day -day issues of water? You know, and you you know equate equip that or equate that to the managers and the hierarchies that need to make decisions on what to be done needs to be done in the water industry. What I've seen and come across, and you know, either me being part of uh, any projects and in maintenance of this equipment and working with teams that are in the water water utility uh, industries. There is a lot of frustration. Uh, to be honest with you. You do have people that, you know, just as I believe in water as being a human right, uh, you know, people who really want to make sure that there is water available where it is needed. But the frustrations, you know, range from uh, either people on the ground might know or will know what needs to be done, but the decisions for what needs to be done on the infrastructure doesn't really or necessarily lie with them. So there's hierarchy issues. You know, uh, utility managers will know what needs to be done, but the decision to do it does not lie uh, with them. So you have challenges now with infrastructure that might need to be maintained on a day-to-day -day basis or infrastructure that might need to be upgraded. But to get decisions to be made for that infrastructure to be upgraded, is, is a big challenge. You know, you've got uh, people that are trying to make sure, you know, they score, you know, if I can put it from a political points, because, you know, your water utilities, most of them are run as parastatums. As far as I'm concerned, it's very few. Maybe in some cases, there could be entities that are run privately, but it is not a lot of them. So you have a lot of, uh, you know, parastatums, you know, you've got government influence. So these organizations are big. So you can imagine when you go through the hierarchies in, you know, in the utility industries, a small decision to do maintenance on infrastructure might need to be taken by you know, people that are in much higher uh, levels of the organization. So it's frustrating because it takes so much time to get things done. So if I can summarize, you see that you know, one, the lack of autonomy for the utility managers to make decisions when decisions need to be made. And you've got budgetary constraints as well within the organizations. So you have on one hand, people on the ground, we will know what needs to be done, but they're often faced with uh, you know, responses coming from uh, you know, management that there is no funds for what they need to be done to, to go ahead. And then you also have, on the other hand, companies that are bringing technologies that can optimize, you know, the systems that we use in, you know, water infrastructures, but the relationships also with suppliers, there is a misalignment, a misalignment. This misalignment is not coming from, you know, maybe, you know, entities, you know, I'll, I'll give Zalem for an example. Uh, Zalem 
is working. They have R&D teams. They intentionally want to bring technologies that help, you know, facilitate better operations, you know, facilitate better maintenance and bring new technologies. But, you know, the relationship with the end user, with the people on the ground, there's a big gap because they're not necessarily talking to those people. They're talking to the people that make decisions. So there is a very big misalignment. And then you take the organization as well on its own. There is quite a lot of communication breakdowns across all levels of the organization. End users don't necessarily talk direct, directly to the people that make the decisions. So you see that their ability to act is often hampered by rigid hierarchies. So the lack of uh, authority on their part brings insufficient support from both management and suppliers. So there is, of course, some exceptional cases where some departments in some areas have gotten it right. But, you know, these scenarios that I've mentioned are most common on the ground to, to many utility managers. By addressing some of these issues, you know, you know, the lack of autonomy, decision making, uh, you know, the budgetary constraints, you know, the frustrations and, you know, poor supplier and user uh, relationships, you know, we can end up empowering ground teams to be more effective and proactive, you know, ultimately leading to better outcomes in infrastructure management. The biggest uh, challenge we face on the call front, when I say we, I'm putting myself in the bracket of people that are looking at these infrastructures, is when you're looking at upgrades of infrastructure, for example, when new technologies come and companies come forward and they brought in, you know, all these uh, new technologies, Projects that need to be done in the water utilities uh, most of the time are quite big. They are on a large scale. So having these uh, large-scale upgrades means the decisions will be taken on a much higher level. It's no longer up to the end user. And then if you look at the time it will take for the approvals to come, there's a big misalignment. I'll give you an example. In one of the countries I've done you know, one, one major uh, water transfer uh, project, this project, when I looked at the documentation, it was approved four years prior to the project being done. So already, when that project was being implemented, the technology had already moved. Because if you look at where we are now, you know, there's a lot of advancement in technology and it's happening quite quick. A few years ago, you're looking at maybe, you know, you know companies would come up with technologies that will, last, will take maybe five years, you know, six years to run their life. But now technologies are moving quite quick because there's a higher demand. So if you look at our region, for example, if I just say Southern Africa, we have seriously aging infrastructure. And many utility managers, all they're doing now is repair. They just try and fix, just make sure water is being pumped. If you talk of upgrades and, you know, add-ons and new technologies, it's a challenge. You bring in the political, uh, uh, you know, um, factor into it, uh, you know, its decisions are being made to make sure uh, if promises were made to pump water to a certain area, uh, that is the primary focus, but we're not looking at upgrading the existing infrastructure, bringing in new technologies. So we're focusing on maintaining whatever is broken today, but we're not focusing on putting something that is sustainable for a longer period of time. So if I can summarize, is on the ground, on the core phase, there is frustrations and it's frustrating but the people running the systems don't necessarily make the decisions. Back to you, James. Thank you very much, Silver. And it, it's kind of what I imagined that you have this frustration. You also have these, as you said, large projects, large organizations, and very clearly a disconnect. And something that actually came up in the preparations for this webinar is that somebody spoke about the fact that your utilities are beholden to policy. Policy takes a long time to develop. It's often influenced by bureaucracy, by politics, etc. And then at the same time, you're trying to establish a site that has to generate value for decades, etc. Uh, I, I wonder if we can draw parallels maybe to the, the aircraft industry where we still have aircraft today are 50, 60 years old that are still flying out there because you've got to kind of pre-plan and, and I suppose uh, future-proof yourself in clever ways. Um, of course, it's a lot harder of utility because uh, aircraft don't go down that often. Whereas if a big pipeline bursts in the city, 
thousands of people know about it immediately. Ruben, I'd like to bring you in on this point, looking at what Silver has brought up there. I think if we maybe look at the rigidity issue uh, to a degree, the lack of community or the gaps of communication in there, or the fact that the decision makers and the people in the front line are not always the same people. To me, at least as somebody who's into technology, the thread there would be data. And I can imagine digital technologies and water could be leveraged more smartly um, to address these things. What's your view? How can water technologies alleviate these frontline challenges, maybe close some of these communication and planning gaps? Thanks, James. And uh, good afternoon to all the people joining us on this webinar today. I think from my perspective, James, I'd like to categorize the challenges that the utilities face into three main sectors. I think the first one is scarcity. Um, the second one is obviously the quality of water. And the third one is accessibility. And to encapsulate it in one statement, from a technological perspective, uh, we can basically improve the access to water and as well promote the efficient use of water. And I'll just break that down a bit more if I can, if I can, if I can get some uh, level on that. In terms of access, I think, you know, that is something that is a major concern across the entire world, more so in Africa. You know, we have a lot of people that do not have access to clean, portable water. And I think you mentioned it earlier on that, you know, a lot of our utilities now are aligning to the SDGs, SDG 6 goal, which is basically talking about, you know, access to clean water, hygiene and sanitation for all. So using technology, we can improve accessibility for water infrastructure across the entire continent. I think the other issue is scarcity. I think most of you are aware that a couple of years ago in Cape Town, we almost went to what we call day zero. Now with the advancement of technology, a lot of utilities, both locally and especially further up north, when you go into North Africa, a lot of utilities are now leveraging on desalination. Desalination in the past has was a very, um, it was a technology that was not viewed favorably. Because of the advancements we've had in the range now, Desalination is now available for most utilities to actually call upon and use as and when required. So that in itself is showing that from a technological perspective, technology can help alleviate the challenges that we face from a water perspective. Contamination. A lot of the water bodies that we have across Africa are heavily contaminated by pathogens. With the advancement in technology, we can now remove a lot of these pathogens from the water and as well provide access to clean portable water to people. You mentioned the issue of communication. I think what's been prevalent, particularly in the water sector, has been the lack of use of data for intelligent decision making. Now data collection, access to the data, data management, and as well coming with intelligent, precise, concise decisions based on the data is now available due to the advancement of IoT. I think Vinenson mentioned it early on that you know we can now go into what we call digital twins. And if I look at the situation that occurred in South Africa, probably about a few weeks ago, where we had the adverse uh, weather condition with all the snow that fell, particularly in the, in the KwaZulu-Natal region, with a digital twin, you can actually assimilate that probability. You can put in place certain scenarios and allow you to make plans ahead of a natural disaster actually occurring. So from a decision-making perspective, that allows the utilities, number one, to proactively plan, get their house in order, and to be able to mitigate any challenges that may arise due to natural disasters that may occur. And that is the role that I see technology actually playing, addressing issues around contamination, uh, accessibility, and scarcity of water across the world as a whole. Back to you, James. Thank you very much. Sorry, my mouse died there for a second. Uh, thank you, Ruben. And I think it shows that there's a lot of potential out there for what we can do with technologies. And I, I suppose to perhaps also add to that, uh, another thing that's come into play for a lot of these technologies is a higher degree of modularity that you don't really have to replace everything in the kitchen sink in order to start getting uh, results. For example, I'm thinking about how in sanitation, the use of 
uh, UV is much more prevalent, not to replace uh, existing sanitation systems, but to enhance them, to improve them, make them a bit more efficient and a bit more cost effective. So there are great possibilities there. Of course, the problem with technology is that we can sometimes get the silver bullet mentality, especially people sitting higher up who only have five minutes to listen to a presentation and they go like, oh, this sounds fantastic. Are we just going to airdrop this thing in there and it's going to fix our problems? Uh, Vanessa, looking at the implementation around technology, choosing and introducing a new technology is tricky. Uh, and so... Twofold questions. Firstly, what are some of the common problems that emerge when utilities try to decide on a, the right technologies for them? And also, is there sometimes, especially higher up, this kind of silver bullet mentality that I mentioned? Thank you, James. Uh, you know, for me, some of the factors that influence this high inertia by our utilities to adopt new technologies is, is really the low appetite to take risk. And, uh, and to implement change. And then there's also the evaluation of technologies and a very biased view on the effectiveness of this technology. It, it is often viewed as technology being the solution to all our problems faced, but the benefits and value derived from the technology is only achieved if the technology is deployed into the right ecosystem. Hence, even in, I think in fairy tales, the silver bullet doesn't kill the werewolf, right? It's how it is uh, fired and the weapon that is used and how efficient it is uh, in firing that. So in the same uh, right, new technologies uh, need to be deployed into the right ecosystem. So let, let, let me unpack a little bit more. New technology systems need to be supported by the right skill sets. The technology is still a tool. It still has, it's still a slave to our ability to deploy it, uh, to use it, and especially to manipulate it. That's where the innovation comes in. The, the quicker we accelerate this adoption of, of technology and upskilling of our human capital and the operations to deploy, use, and uh, manipulate the technology, the better the chance we have of getting ahead of this rate of decay that is happening on our infrastructure. And again, as I said, if, if we can get ahead of that rate of decay, it pushes us into a position of proaction as well, as opposed to the situation that we find ourselves in, which is just purely reaction. So we need to shift the focus from evaluating uh, our, our refurbishment and our, our CapEx budgets from just new mechanical uh, equipment, uh, new process technology, new automation technology, and, and this being in isolation uh, as the primary solution, but evaluating the use of digital enhancements equally, digital solutions as part of that primary solution. Uh, don't get me wrong, we, we need to fix the leaking pipe, right? And, and whilst doing so, evaluating a new process to fix that pipe and new materials that enhance the lifespan of that pipe is absolutely important, but with equal urgency and importance, we need to adopt the digital solutions that provide us the intelligence of identifying the leaks, prioritizing which leaks to fix so we can plan the use of our limited resources, optimizing our resources by fixing just the leak and getting ahead of the rate of decay by identifying future leaks. So in essence, uh, I still maintain that the technologies that we and the mindset shift that we need to get into is bringing digitalization as important as the normal evaluation. And this means that the barriers of risk appetite need to change. We need to see the importance of this shift. This is the fourth industrial revolution. Sorry, you're on mute there, James. There we go. Sorry, I think I clicked the wrong button there. Thank you. You know, we cannot have a webinar of somebody at least saying that once, you know. Um, so, yes, I, I really appreciate that challenge that on the one hand, and uh, Silver also mentioned this, that there's such a, a view on the operational side and I suppose the rate of decay or in another parlance, constantly putting out fires, that uh, trying to get ahead of the problem is a significant challenge. Digitization definitely 
provides an opportunity to get ahead of that challenge, especially because uh, that information is already, often already available uh, on the site, generating data as it were. Um, but let's have a look at what the guys at the front line, how they feel about technology and whether they are even in a position to connect this. And so there is a question for you. You work often with these teams in the front. What about current technology, if anything, is exciting them? Or if, if they had a blank check, they'd say, yes, we bring this or that immediately into our operations. Are, is there anything right now that the guys are thinking about? Or are they just so focused on keeping the lights on that they're not thinking about what they can do with technology? Oh, yeah, James. It's, uh, I mean, this is something that even excites me, you know, just talking about it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you, you'd be surprised that even the utility managers and the people on the ground, they do keep up with technology. You know, these are people who are constantly looking at what's out there because, you, you know, I will often speak of people, you know, men of integrity, men and women of integrity. You do have genuinely people that want to get things done. And they're constantly looking at what can make, you know, life better, what can improve on, you know, on what they're doing. And sometimes they do know and understand there is a disconnect because what they want uh, done or, you know, what they want to see uh, being implemented might not necessarily uh, happen the way that they want because, like I mentioned early on, there is issues with, you know, hierarchies and how far they can go. But, they, I mean, it's exciting. If you look at the technologies like Xylem, you know, if I can mention is 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 one of these companies that are leading in, in you know technologies that we are embracing now on the ground you know i without mentioning you know particular projects or names you know we are recipients of some of the latest technologies that zalem is uh, rolling out there you know you know if you talk to people on the ground nothing is as interesting as flipping and you know changing how things used to be i remember a time a few years ago when we were talking about, you know, the amount of data that we were collecting from our plants, our operating plants, it was quite a lot. I can tell you for sure, you know, I looked at statistics. We had almost 60% of the data we collected, we never utilized it. We, we couldn't analyze it because we didn't have the tools. But now if you look at all the tools that are coming out that people can use, you know, you've got your predictive maintenance is top of the list. Guys on the ground are excited about now your predictive maintenance tools that are coming out. You know, like Ruben mentioned, the digital twin. I mean, this is so exciting because, you know, guys now feel like they're not on their own. You know, you're looking at your plans and, you know, you, you, you know you cannot be in many places at the same time. Your digital twin is one of those solutions, you know, that is, you know, exciting the guys on the ground. Now, you also have support, you know, in, in cases where, upgrades are being done and new technologies are coming, uh, you know, into, into the systems. You've got support now via your virtual reality, for example. Things that would require somebody to, to come through from, from, from distances, from afar, because these are new technologies. Now you don't necessarily need to have, you've got a virtual re reality where you can use your goggles in the plant and you get support when you need it. So you're actually now helping optimize your plant and, you know, you, at, at least alleviating delays that no, no, normally you'd have to wait for someone for three days, but now it's just a phone call away and you can connect with someone in another part of the world and you get to do your maintenance and your plant is up and running. So there's quite a lot of tools I can mention. You know, we've got an exciting project happening elsewhere where instead of having your conventional control systems, now you, you're getting the likes of Xylem bringing pumps that are, that are you know, integrated pumping systems. That, you know, you've got your pump, it's got a VSD inbuilt, and it's got its own control system. It's almost like plug and play into the system. So that's some of the things that are exciting, you know, people on the ground. And with the training uh, that, you know, all these systems are coming with, I'm glad to know that, you know, uh, the likes of Xylem, they're not only rolling out these technologies uh, on the ground. They also now you know, affording the end users the training that is required so that guys are up and running with the new technologies, you know, they're up to speed quicker than you'd traditionally, uh, uh, you know, do. So, yeah, so those are some of the things that are exciting on the ground, if I can mention a few. Back to you, James. Thank, 
Thank you, Silver. Yes, uh, I I've also seen a lot of these comes past, and another, this is where things get very exciting. Wow, we can do a lot of it. And I love your point there that at some point the majority of the data being generated on the site was not even being used. Now we have those opportunities. Uh, there are also ways to bring in more efficiencies to run things more effectively, which will help costs because hopefully you need smaller teams or you can focus your skills elsewhere. But let, let's look a little bit closer at that. Ruben, um, if you look at utilities across Africa, Southern Africa, the areas you cover, um, how are they addressing some of these priorities? Are they, are they using some of these technologies? Are they using, for example, data or bringing in more smart pumps? So what, what are the actual trends you're seeing out there? So th thanks, James. I think, you know, over the years, we've seen an evolution in the way that the utilities are addressing the water challenges. If I take a step back and probably look about five to 10 years back, you know, the main focus for most water utilities was water provision. But invariably, when you consume water, you generate waste. So now we had a waste problem that came on stream because of all the access that was being pushed into the market. So now there's been a shift within the utility spectrum to say, look, we now need to look at water from an entire value chain perspective, not only from a clean water provision, but through to a wastewater management perspective. So that's one area that I think I've seen a paradigm shift in which the way the utilities are trying to address the challenges in the sector. I think the second one, we kind of touched on it a bit in terms of the approach that's been developed now. A lot of the utilities have aligned to this SDG6 goal. I think that's the underpinning mantra for most of the utilities. Access to clean water, hygiene and sanitation for all. That's what the goal basically talks about. And a lot of the utilities are basically focusing their attention to actually meeting SDG 6 goals, I think by about 2030, if I, if I, if I recall it quite well. I think we've also seen a growing appetite within the utility players um, for privatization. And this is coming through the form of triple P's. You know, there's, a, there's talk of triple P's being developed across Africa as a whole. You know, the public-private partnership. And this is basically going to, number, number one, increase the level of investment in the utility sector and as well improve and enhance service delivery. I think another area that, you know, where they've taken a bit of introspection in looking at themselves is what is the financial sustainability of a utility? I think uh, most of us have now know the have heard about the acronym in NRW non revenue water. It's now the new buzzword within the utility sector because non revenue water addresses quite a number of uh, yields that are in the system before. Linked number one to water access and number two linked to financial stability. So by addressing non revenue water, they are basically addressing a number of challenges that will allow them to reach out to a greater audience and into a greater market. And when you look at the NRW spectrum, for example, how has non-revenue water been basically addressed from a problem perspective? The buzzword is technology. There's a number of technologies that the utilities have leveraged on to try and address NRW. I think Vinenson mentioned it earlier on. We've got smart metering and billing systems. Smart meters have become a common thing across most utilities across Africa. We're looking at uh, leak detection, you know, network monitoring and network management creating DMAs to create a water balance to see how is your water being used. Number one, from the point of actually generating the water and pushing it into the system. And number two, the outcomes from your billing system. If there's a disparity in that, then you know that you've got a challenge and you need to actually look for where the, where the potential losses may be. We've seen a lot of GIS mapping of pipe networks and uh, systems across, the, across uh, most utilities. All this from a technological perspective has helped the utilities become number one one more efficient, and number two, to optimize and get that level of financial sustainability that allows them to grow and develop in the market. And I think another area, I think I saw a question from Peter in one of the Q&As, is around capacity building. You know, there's been a lot of introspection in terms of the operational efficiencies of the utilities. And I think what they're trying to invest in at the moment is capacity building. How do we get our guys on the front line to be at the forefront of number one, not only adopting the technologies, but understanding and being able to implement it, the technologies. So they've reached out to quite a number of players, Zalem being one of those as well, where there's a lot of information sharing, a lot of thought leadership and thought knowledge transfer that is happening. And all this capacity building is something that I believe should be continued to be driven in the utility sector, because they, the more they become experts in the realm of what they're actually trying to do, the better their service delivery is going to be. So that's how I see, you know, from a technological perspective and 
how the utilities are trying to address the challenges. It's a bit of introspection, aligning with specific SDG six goals as their underpinning motto, and adopting technologies to help them drive the philosophy of water supply into the communities. Thank you, Ruben. So we, we are hearing the realignment, which uh, gets to the earlier point of, uh, as you said, looking at the whole value chain. Uh, Vanessa also spoke about that, uh, looking at SDG 6, so more of a holistic approach on these things. And then building that capacity is key. A good point. Nice segue, because Silver, I do want to bring you in on that point. Uh, what do the guys in the front line need uh, to help them get the most from these technologies? Are we talking skills? Are we talking more support from uh, their bosses or from the suppliers, from the actual channel to give to them? If you speak to these guys, if, what would they like from those so they are able to actually, what, what support would they like so that they can start implementing the right technologies and getting the results they're looking for? Thank you, James. Yeah, I, I think the first thing, you know, from what you have said now, I can start off with, you know, we we, we, we look, we need to foster, you know, better collaboration between all the stakeholders involved. You know, I, I mentioned earlier as well, like, the, you know, the communication gaps between the different levels is frustrating because you don't really address the things that need to be done on the ground. Uh, the biggest thing uh, I can say for sure what that I've seen, it is okay to have, you know, the technologies coming in and the technology will keep uh, you know, developing, new systems will keep coming in, but there's a very big disconnect between the people, the resources, the people we look to look after these technologies, you know, it can be starting from installations, you know, your maintenance when the plants are running is we are trusting people to figure it out <laughs> on their own. That's why it's important now what we're seeing, you know, entities, you know, companies like Xylem coming in with, when technology comes out, emphasis is put on training, 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 training. You can never go wrong when you ensure you're empowering people to be able to operate the equipment that you are, uh, you know, bringing to them. And they also, you know, know how to maintain uh, this kind of equipment that is coming in. So training is critical. I mean, you're looking at uh, before the status quo was, if you want any kind of training, you've got to pay for it. But now I think that is changing. Now we realize that it is important. If you you bring out, you know, a very piece, a good piece of equipment, if you have people that are not able to run that equipment or maintain it or repay it, it it's no good. You know, after you have one or two problems, you tend to blame it on the equipment. You tend to blame it on who has supplied that equipment. So the, the reality on the ground is you better have people that are trained. They need to be trained on the right technologies. But I'll say something that I've, that I've um, uh, you know, noticed that's happening. Yes, we're talking about training. We're looking at guys that are already have come through some kind of training or be it just academic, uh, uh, you know, studies, and they come out of institutions, for example, or institutes, your, your institutes of learning, and then they start from zero again when they come into the industry, relearning what's actually, you know, uh, being used in the industries. We recently sat down with a, a, a big panel of, um, you know, uh, prof uh, let's say professors from a high institute of learning. What they came to try and, you know, get from us was, can we sit down and look at how best can we align our curriculums, you know, curriculum to what the industry is bringing out there? I mean, this is a fact. We have a lot of curriculum in schools. South Africa is not an exception. It's also, you know, part of, uh, you know, the areas where we've seen that you have a lot of tra people training in the engineering field. When they come out of the institutes, they have to relearn and or start from zero to grasp the technology. So we now need to collaborate with those uh, uh, edu educational institutes so that the training, the, the edu education that the, the engineers are getting, when they come to the field, it's it's already aligned. They're getting ready to come into the market, so it doesn't become difficult. For example, Salem is not going to come back and start, you know, educating people from the grassroots. So our learnings, when we are at the higher institutes of learnings, we need to include components 
that I'm, you know, keeping up with where the world is going. So our technologies are moving fast, like I said. So we need to bring in guys in the field that are ready to learn these technologies. So training, 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 I cannot overemphasize. is something that needs to be done throughout. The other thing is we often look at training as, you know, something that is taking money, like it costs money to train. Yes, it costs money to train, but when we look at it as an investment, then it changes everything. You know, when you train people, what you're doing is those people are going to be able to, you know, make sure they maintain the equipment and the plants that they are operating. Therefore, they're optimizing on that equipment, less breakdowns, and we're, costing, we're saving costs. So training is far much more important. And then the other thing will be uh, we human resources, these are people. So when we speak of frustrations, when people don't really... Uh, seem to be getting help from anywhere they look at. You know, utility managers are in between. They look up into management, they're not getting support. They look into even in the political uh, area, they're not getting support. Or it might be there, but it's not aligned. So we need that emotional support as well. The people on the ground, assurances that the technologies that are coming to them, they will get support. That's why it's important for us to foster relationships, you know, even between the suppliers and the developers of this technology, that they understand what are the challenges on the ground, then they can support the end user better. Back to you, James. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Silver. I think it very much shows that the, the overall ethos is support. Support through training, support through understanding education. Earlier heard that uh, people out there know what's happening, but because it's dealing with a very complex environment and to Silver's point, we are dealing with professionals who are already trained in lots of different ways. Now they've got to retrain and things or align their knowledge of the new knowledge. Um, I don't want to say hand holding, but I definitely think that it has to be an ecosystem approach, which goes back to what Ruben also said that there is now looking at the whole value chain and how that fits in together with each other. So hopefully, uh, we are seeing more proactivity on that. We have a few more questions for the panelists, but if gentlemen, if you don't mind, I'd like to just quickly jump into some of the questions we're getting on the Q&A. We've got quite a few of them here. So how I will do this is I am not going to direct this specifically at one of you. I'd rather look at you to please just throw your hat into the arena. Also, if more than one of you would like to answer a question, please feel free to. And let's start here with an interesting one from TD saying, um, does desalination have a role in South Africa in aiding the day zero crisis? Should we start building desalination plants in South Africa? I'd like to maybe come in here, uh, James. For sure, desalination has a role. Like my colleague has mentioned, desalination is a technology that has been adopted Africa-wide, worldwide. Uh, it is a key uh, water source to to bring in to supplement our or to to manage our water uh, use uh, supply, but I want to open up ourselves to reuse. We really need before, and I'm not deprioritizing desalination, but I am saying that we need to look at as a priority our culture of single use, where we need to move into the space of reuse. This is a sustainable way forward. We have the technology, we have the experience, and we have the knowledge to bring this reuse culture and technology and into to really manage our water supply. Our, we have to get into this position of understanding that the, the way we need to be more sustainable in how we abstract water, be it ground sources, or even if we go and start doing desalination and abstracting water from the ocean. This cannot be done without us bringing as a core culture and technology into our system, which is reuse. I think that's an incredibly valid point, especially because South Africa is not both a, a very big groundwater user, but also we are seeing issues of our aquifers or boreholes and stuff like that. And we're also seeing a lot of raw sewage just being put into rivers and such. Uh, and and the, the second question here from Maboko, now he's asking specifically, what does mining have, what effect does mining have on water resources and mining communities? Maboko, I want to take a liberty here. I want to expand that question a little bit more. Uh, mining is one sector that uses a lot of water in South Africa. Uh, another one, agriculture, I believe, is the leading one. We also have industry. Now, we are today talking about water utilities and kind of the public sector sense, but 
all of these uh, sectors also use a lot of water. They can invest in a utility level uh, uh, processes. They can also look at water reuse. So maybe we should ask, what is the effect of these different sectors on water resources in South Africa? And what advice would you guys give them? Should they start thinking a bit like utilities themselves? So, so James, if, if I can jump in on that question, I, I think... Um, from an industrial and from a mining perspective, one of the biggest concerns in the past was around contamination of water, open water bodies and groundwater. Uh, because of, you know, the, the process that are in play at most of these uh, facilities does result in a lot of waste being generated. And that was generally being used to, and to contaminate open water bodies. I think there's been a shift in recent years. I think um, the environmental protection agencies are really coming to the fore in this regard. In terms of, one, stakeholder engagement with these active players, going to the mines, going to the industrial players, giving them an understanding of the effect of the downstream effect of the operations as far as water contamination is concerned. And, and just to answer your question, I think, yes, these entities or these uh, industrial hubs need to look at themselves as if they are a self-contained water ecosystem. And once again, I'm going to leverage on what Vinesan basically said. I think we've actually seen in recent years a bit of a shift, particularly in the, in the industrial space, where they're saying, okay, fine, we're producing X amount of wastewater. How can we reuse that water to bring our own operational costs down and to create to avoid the impact that we have on open water bodies? So, yes, there is a willingness amongst the people right now at the moment to adopt new technologies and to start thinking along the lines of reuse and avoiding the contamination of water bodies through the operations. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, just for audience, I am jumping around these questions a little bit. I'm trying to get the most pertinent ones or relevant ones out there first before we run out of time. I've got a question here from Marie who says that uh, there are a range of technological or possible technology solutions for integrated water systems, etc. But non-revenue water, water loss and system decay, contamination, these are the very big issues. What, in your view, is the first necessary step to addressing these issues at local level? Um, and is this process underway? So I don't know if we can comment too much on what the guys are doing uh, from a higher level, but what are the necessary steps? Silver, maybe if you can weigh in on this, what are you seeing as, let's say, the low-hanging fruit or the mission-critical things that can be done to arrest uh, revenue, non-revenue water leaks and decay? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll speak uh, in general here because I might not know exactly, you know, what's uh, uh, how this, uh, you know, the level of non-revenue water or the leaks in South Africa. But I do know it's quite common to a lot of infrastructure. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of uh, technology we have now. You know, when you're looking at your, uh, yeah, let me bring, for example, your, 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 your sensors, your flow meters, your your systems to monitor uh, leakages. You know, when you have a system that, you know, intentionally you want to make sure you arrest leakages and you are able to know, you know, where you're losing your water, it helps for you to be to run your systems efficiently. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the case studies that I was involved in where there was water transfer from one part of the country to another, we realized that out of uh, the many millions of water that were being pumped, only 40% of the water that was being transferred reached the plants that were intended to, uh, you know, purify that water. So that's a lot of water that was being lost just through the infrastructure, leaks. You know, sometimes we look at leaks and we think, uh, you know, it's a leak, it will be fixed and all that, but... What you see on some of these small leaks, just the tip of the iceberg, you know, on the ground, you're losing quite a lot of water. And normally we don't translate that to cost. If you look at that amount of water that is being lost and you evaluate it and you put it into cost, it's a lot of money. So you, you cannot emphasize the need for us to have systems that monitor your, your water leaks you know, starting from your water transfers to where you're distributing water, because there's two things. You've got your water transfers, therefore your raw water, and you've got distribution of water as well. You know, in those two areas, the water leaks uh, cost uh, uh, quite a lot. So making sure we have technologies that are monitoring and we have pre predictive uh, maintenance tools in that area, 
can help before we start trying to solve the problem, we actually prevent the problem from happening. Back to you, James. Thank oh, you. Sorry, so James, if, if, if I can just also... jump in there, James, on, on that uh, question. Yes, I think... uh, Ruben and then Vanessa, thank you. Yeah. Probably one of the starting points for most players in the utility sector is to try and get a better understanding of the depth of the problem. You know, when it comes to non-revenue water, you need to know what the baseline is you're working with. I think that's probably a bit of a dark art at the moment in the sense there's a lot of unknowns that go into it. So my advice to the utility players is get a better understanding of the depth of the problem that you currently have. Establish a baseline for your non-revenue water and then introduce interventions to reduce it over a period of time. You know, when you're talking about, um, I think um, Marie mentioned the issue of uh, system decay, you know, from an infrastructure perspective. Have an indication if it's rapid urbanization that is your problem, at what rate is your urbanization growing in relation to the capacity of your installed base when it comes to water supply and uh, sanitation, for example. Once you get those baselines established, then interventions are very easy to put in place. But when you deal it in the absence of actually having a clear understanding of the depth of the problem, it's almost like shooting in the, in, in the dark. You're not aiming at a specific target and you're hoping to hit something. So let's create that baseline. Let's establish the exact nature of the problem, the extent of the problem, and then slowly and progressively introduce interventions to alleviate the challenges in the system. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa? So I'm a victim of my colleagues getting on this question before me, but I'm going to try my best to bring a, a dimension to this as well and build on what uh, my colleagues have said. And I, I just want to put this out there. You cannot control what you're not measuring. And you cannot fix what you can't see. So for me, in answering this question, those are the priority steps that we need to take. So the question was more of what is the necessary first steps? That's the necessary first steps. We need to measure. We, we have technology like uh, advanced metering infrastructure, which allows you to have pinpointed views of the consumptions and what locations and how these things, how your water is being consumed. We have technology existing in this world that allows you to identify leaks on pipelines, pinpointing them to within centimeters and meters so that you can focus your repairs and optimize your, your resources that you have. These are, for me, the necessary first steps. We are always in this reactionary mode where we are fixing a water leak when we see the leak. We need to identify those that you cannot see. We need to start measuring so that we can anticipate and we can see where our consumptions are going. That, that for me, is what I just wanted to weigh in a bit there, James. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can squeeze in one more question before we conclude on all of these. Uh, just scanning down here, what would be most relevant? Maybe, uh, uh, Vanessa, just to follow up on that, Victoria does have a question here that you can use data analytics and to create predictive maintenance uh, and optimize operational performance. But as you say, and to your point, you need to measure these things. What would be the examples of first steps or the easiest way to just start getting an idea with your data? Let's assume you have data already on site. What, what are some of the simplest ways to just start building a picture? Let's talk for the utility manager who's maybe trying to motivate to his bosses, hey, this is what my dashboard is showing. This is what we need to do. What would you recommend to them? So I'd like to take it one step back, uh, James. We have utilities that are on a various points of the digital maturity curve. We have utilities that don't even have a dashboard. And we have utilities that have a dashboard but don't know what to do with it. Okay. So I'm going to take the question from a perspective of the digital maturity. We need to have fit for purpose digital solutions brought in based on where you sit on that digital maturity so that you can then bring in that data and then know what to do to transform it into information or intelligence that will inform your, your decision making. So there's various levels of technologies one bring in. A lot of our utilities are quite advanced in terms of automated operations. They already have the data, but this data is not strung together to tell a story, to tell you how to, to make a decision. And that's where things like our artificial intelligence uh, digital solutions, your digital twins, and so forth, come and play a very vital role. But if we take it down one level to the to the equipment level, we already have equipment that is running, and we know this equipment to be critical pieces of equipment, and they can be retrofitted with top hats of machine learning. 
that then start putting you into a position of not routine maintenance, but predictive maintenance, so that you can, auto you can already start foreseeing the problem before the problem occurs and start preparing for, for it. It is much easier to maintain on a foreseeable future than to maintain on a surprise. So this, this is what data analytics brings to us. And this is, there's, a, there's a multitude of technologies available for us to implement on our existing equipment and infrastructure that bring us these various levels of decision intelligence where we sit on that digital maturity curve. Thank you, Vanessa. And, and unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time here today. I'd also am respectful of you, the attendees. You have other things to do. The uh, questions will be sent to the panelists later. They will endeavor to answer them as well. So thank you for sharing those. Right now, I would like to quickly conclude for each of our panelists, just for 30 seconds, give some of their final thoughts, starting with Silver and then Ruben and then to Vanessa. And so Silver, just some closing thoughts from you. You muted, Mike. <laughs> yeah, from my side, I think, uh, you know, I cannot overemphasize the need for the people on the ground now. They do know, uh, you know, technologies that are out there. So I can quickly say new technologies that are such as IoT-based uh, uh, monitoring systems is quite crucial now. You know, you've got AI-driven predictive uh, analytics that, you know, we can utilize because, yes, like you, panel, uh, my fellow panelists have said, there's a lot of data we can collect and a lot of tools we can use. So we need to also embrace these AI-driven predictive analytics, your automated systems, you know, that can also help us, you know, you can transform, you know, how we manage the water infrastructure. And I know that Salem is one of those companies leading in that area. And then you also have, the, you know, these tools, they're only not, not only giving us, uh, you know, an insight on what we are doing, but they're providing data in real time, you know, in real time. So we know what is happening, you know, we can predict you know, the life of our equipment, we can predict what might fail and we can make sure we do what's necessary so that equipment doesn't fail, thereby we reducing the downtime of any of our equipment. But we also need to make sure that the people that will run these systems are well equipped. So training, training, training is going to be a, an important part of all this. Thank Back you very you. much, Silver. Uh, Ruben, your final thoughts. Um, from my perspective, um, the opportunities in the sector exist. I think um, embracing technology, um, stakeholder engagement, and capacity building within the utility sector itself are going to be in the forefront of turning the corner when it comes to this uh, most precious resource. And I think, you know, my advice to the players in the sector is reach out to players and technology providers that are prevalent in the industry, you know, bounce ideas off them, have the continuous engagement, be open to changes in technology and be willing to drive the change that you want to see in the industry as well. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, Vanessa, your final thoughts for today. You know, uh, to my audience and to my colleagues, uh, I, I saw a question on there on, on PPP, public-private partnerships. And I, and I think I want to give my final thoughts around something around this lines. What should public-private partnerships are not just a financial-based uh, partnership. But it, it's also a partnership of what you expect from your technology provider. What do we as technology providers bring uh, through to you? And I can tell you, we bring technology packaged into bespoke solutions that will solve your problems. Uh, I don't mean to sound arrogant, but we see the same problems faced by our utilities and water and wastewater service providers across the continent and the globe. And, and we acknowledge that uh, we acknowledge these problems, actually. But, but what is very much unique is their challenges. And that's what we are able to help you overcome. Utilities uh, should work closer with our technology providers so that we can customize our current solutions and technologies to overcome your challenges. So my final thought is really on how do we build this bridge and gap and how do we form partnerships to overcome these problems uh, and really leveraging off the global exposure that us as technology providers have, the leveraging of our knowledge of the trends, our knowledge of the maturation of certain digital technologies and other technologies, and also our viewpoints on social and economic trends that we are seeing. So we have a lot of information experience that we can bring 
But this information and experience is really worthless if we aren't able to partner with you and see how we can apply to your unique challenges. That, that's from my side, James. Thank you so much, and thank you to the audience. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And I think we just to reiterate that point, the whole world is currently shifting the dial on utilities. Uh, you often see use cases come out, new experiences come out. A big part of technology, and I cover other areas as well in technology, not just uh, water, but digitization in general, is the vast amount of shared knowledge available out there and the vast amount of nuanced solutions that can be applied. You don't need to move the mountain in this case, or even if you want to, you can move it in small little loads. It's quite incredible what can be done out there. It does look very complex from the outside, but it is really terrific of what you can do out there. With that, though, thank you very much. You heard there from Vanessa and Governor from Asylum Africa, as well as his colleague Ruben Maroa, also Asylum Africa, and we had Silva Piri from CPRO Africa. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today, and I'll be handing back to Shannon now. Thank you, Shannon. Over to you. Thanks so much, James. That brings us to the end of the webinar. Thank you so much to our moderator, James Francis, for facilitating this discussion, and to our panelists, Silva Piri from CPRO Africa, Vanessa Govender from Xylem, and Ruben Maroa from Xylem for their input into the discussion. Thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on South Africa's water utility challenges. If you're interested in hearing more about Xylem, please visit their website at www.xylem.com. Xylem innovates and collaborates with utilities, industrial manufacturers, buildings operators, and communities to protect and optimize water. Using global reach combined with local know-how, together with customers, Xylem makes water resources more sustainable, championing those dedicated to making water work every day. A reminder that the recording of today's webinar will be made available to all stakeholders. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. I thank you so much for your time and goodbye. <laughs>